Hi Sanjay. Hi Mohit, how are you? How are you doing? Kesu, all good. Bilkul, badiya. All good. Fantastic. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Welcome, Gaurav. Thank you for being here. We have lots of friends who are attending the, the webinar. Uh, everybody's super excited. People have been calling up and uh, saying that uh, I hope there's no glitch this time. I said, yeah, <laughs> uh, you yeah. know, fingers crossed. Uh, things should go well. And, um, uh, you know, this is, uh, Sanjay, this is one topic which people know, um, you know, about the science, about the biology, but they don't, they've not spent, they've not had the opportunity to spend time looking for these things in their backyards or anywhere else, right? These are, these are little things that, um, that are not so, um, aptly visible to the eye you know you need to be trained to do this so so this is um, uh, so this chapter of yours is absolutely <clears throat> you know uh, wonderful and and i'm glad you're here today to talk about your expertise and talk about butterflies and moths and you know how to watch them you know how to read them also if if needed so uh, uh, you know so friends welcome Welcome for this wonderful webinar by um, an old friend of mine, uh, Sanjay Sondi, who's here. Uh, welcome, Perruzan, uh, Priyamabada, Dr. Sharad, Karma, Karma, oh, good to see you, Karma. Karma from Bhutan, Gopal, Rashmi, Leslie, Kalp Kalpana, and, and a you know, a whole lot of friends are here. Thank you for being here. I will quickly introduce uh, Sanjay to you. So Sanjay Sandhi is a Dehradun based naturalist, an engineering graduate from IIT Kanpur. Um, the study of natural history has been his passion for more than three decades. His natural history interests include studying, photographing and writing about nature with a special interest in birds, butterflies, moths and amphibians and reptiles. He spent 20 years in the corporate world and in 2009, he set up Titli Trust. Titli Trust dot uh, Type this down, um, you know, uh, Gaurav, for people to click. So it's a nature conservation non-profit organization which is devoted to studying and protecting India's lesser known flora and fauna. Titli Trust primary focus is biodiversity research and conservation, conservation and livelihoods human wildlife conflict and nature outreach and education through citizen science. So, so that's a bit about uh, Sanjay. Uh, those people who, who are here for, for the first time uh, in this webinar, um, uh, let me quickly um, tell them about myself. I am Mohit Agarwal. Um, first, I am friends with Sanjay for a long, long time. Um, I'm an experiential ecotourism specialist. I'm the founder of Asian Adventures. Uh, which is uh, the largest birding company uh, in India. And we are on a mission to save the elephant corridors, uh, free the Himalayas of plastic waste. And also uh, my personal interest is in keeping the originality of ancient temples, Himalayan temples alive. So that's a bit about me. And I am currently uh, uh, holding the, the position of vice chair of, um, uh, you know, um, uh, Asian Ecotourism Network. Uh, the, the mandate is to, uh, to bring more and more tourism companies um, into the ambit of ecotourism and turn them into ecotourism companies. So over to you, Gaurav. Uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, namaste, everyone. Am I audible? Uh, sorry, I was having some technical yes. issues. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes, so, own. namaste everyone. My name is uh, Gaurav Nalkur. Uh, I'm an avid bird watcher, a uh, great nature lover, and uh, I'm a big believer in the fact that uh, wildlife tourism and ecotourism, when done properly, of course, can be great tools for conservation and uh, conservation awareness. Uh, educationally, I'm qualified as a wildlife researcher and professionally, I'm uh, training to be an ecotourism specialist, especially to work with ecologies and local communities. And uh, luckily, for the last few years, I've been working with uh, Asian Adventures and Mohit 
uh, both of whom share my goal of uh, using wildlife tourism as uh, you know a great conservation tool wonderful so over to you sanjay uh, you can get started with uh, with your magic Thanks. let's uh, so feel yeah and, uh, friends uh, one one last thing just in case if there's some internet glitch don't go away i have a thing called here panic button which i'll press and the system will reboot and come back in 2 minutes but you don't go away just in case if there's an internet glitch otherwise uh, we could go yeah over to you sanjay you want me to start the slide presentation for you i'm starting it okay can everyone see it yeah okay thanks uh, every, can everyone see it? it to me it's visible okay great so uh, thanks for the introduction uh, mohit and uh, thanks uh, gorov as well uh, you know i'm going to deep dive into something that's very close to my heart uh, which is uh, you know butterflies and moths but uh, i'm basically what i'm going to do is i don't have a presentation but uh, i have this uh, 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 ebook uh, or a pdf of the ebook which i'm going to walk you all through but before i do that i want to tell you the 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 history behind how this uh, book happened so you know i have uh, always reared butterflies and moths occasionally uh, not uh, with a great deal of uh, uh rigor primarily because if you are rearing butterflies and moths especially at home you need to be at home and i'm not at home very often i mean i travel i love to travel to the forests and uh, typically i'm out uh, of the house uh, at least uh, two to three weeks at least two weeks in a month so i'm never at home long enough well unfortunately or fortunately covid hit and when covid hit you know all of us were at home and so was i i'm very fortunate that i live in dehradun and i have a small garden no more than 200 square yards which is wild i mean we've just let it let it grow and do whatever let whatever grows grow and during uh, the first wave of covid i said wow i'm going to be at home now for months on end so i said now let me uh, rear butterflies and moths and uh, you won't believe this but during uh, the fir- the first 3 months of the first 4 months of covid when i was at home i completed something like 50 life cycles of butterflies and moths all from my home garden at the same time i said uh, if there are so many butterflies and moths maybe i should do a small monitoring project and see how many moths i i have in my home and during that period of time i started a moth monitoring project at home where twice a month i set up a moth screen and i figure out how many moths i get and right now my species count for the home garden is 413 moth species okay and a lot of them i have been able to find only because i've done i've reared the caterpillars otherwise i wouldn't be seeing them so with this background i said wow man i mean now that you know i've i've been i've spent four months rearing constantly rearing butterflies and moths uh i must finally do this uh, book that i've been wanting to do for a very very long time which is basically a simple guide uh which is meant to be used primarily by uh, students and teachers but obviously all nature lovers can can do it when i started off doing this book i was very clear that i wanted it to be illustrated and uh, i couldn't think of anybody beyond uh, uh, sushma durve who's a illustrator from uh, pune based illustrator i worked uh, with her in the past on a book uh, called uh, critters in your home which is a children's book uh, you know talking about lesson on fauna uh, just in and around your home and she's a wonderful illustrator and i would say 95% of the credit of this book basically goes to her for the 
incredible illustrations that she's done making it almost life like and uh, you know kudos to her for a really 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 nice job so let me do a deep dive i mean you know i should explain uh, why i mentioned that rearing butterflies and moths requires you to be at home and the main reason for that is typically a butterfly or a moth life cycle will take any, anything between 3 to 5 weeks and uh, those 3 to 5 weeks uh, you need to be around i mean there are things that you need to do almost on a daily basis to look after them and that's what i'm going to walk you through when i uh walk you through this booklet so uh you know talking about butterflies and moths uh, uh typically there are about 1400 plus species of uh, uh butterflies from india and more than 12000 species of uh moths uh the very interesting thing is that uh, you know since independence uh, since india's independence we probably added maybe half a dozen butterfly species to uh, uh indian butterfly fauna but on an average between uh, 50 to 100 new moth species are being described in india on an annual basis and i think that's probably too slow i mean i'm it's my estimate that at least another few thousand moth species are still awaiting discovery waiting to be discovered because we haven't studied these creatures enough uh i won't spend too much time on this there are six butterfly families known from india uh skippers blues brush footed white yellows and metal marks uh these are some of the common most common species that you would see almost throughout india representatives of each of these families and uh, common moth families is a far more difficult thing to do uh, you know there are six moth six butterfly families in india but uh, in the moth world there are more than 100 families and covering all of them in this book was almost impossible so i basically just stuck to some of the very very common uh, moth families such as the emperor of the silk moths the hawk moths these two are the i would say the most prominent families primarily because they are large sized moths and then there are swallowtail moths geometer moths uh, you know uh, owlet fruit piercing moths uh, the tiger and footman moths a whole and lots of other families that are all nicely illustrated with some common uh, moths that you could see uh Uh, for many many and this is especially for kids because many people actually ask me many children the very first question that they ask is what's the difference between butterflies and moths so i've just nicely illustrated uh, you know giving the differences common differences between butterflies and moths for a layman i, I haven't got into any of the scientific stuff but uh, you know i would say that for most people who are uh, uh, casual observers the easiest way to tell butterflies and moths apart are by looking at their antenna where uh, you know the moth antenna uh, are not clubbed whereas butterfly antenna are clubbed and if you're looking at caterpillars then typically uh, butterfly caterpillars are not very hairy whereas many moth caterpillars are hairy it doesn't mean that all of them are hairy but many of them are hairy that's uh, one way of telling them apart the life cycle of both butterflies and moths are uh, very similar this is actually a very common butterfly throughout india called the tony coster its uh, host plant is uh, uh, the passion flower basically passiflora species and uh, the life cycle is something that most people would know but i'll still walk through it you know it first lays uh, the the adult butterfly lays eggs uh, it typically takes about a 5 to 7 days for the eggs to hatch then the caterpillars emerge and uh, the caterpillars go through four stages that means these are called four instars as the caterpillars grow in size they shed their skin and they grow larger and uh, then the caterpillar pupates and becomes a pupa and uh, that takes probably uh, 10 days or so 
and then uh, in another week to 10 days the adult butterfly emerges so typically the cycle of uh, a butterfly from egg to adult is about four to five weeks now the really important thing to note both about butterflies and moths and this is something that actually impacts every one of us is that both butterflies and moths have something called larval host plants so what does that mean what that means is that uh, most butterflies and moths have some very specific plant species on which they lay their eggs these are called the larval host plants some species have just one host plant some species have got multiple host plants but if that if their host plant is not present in a particular area you will not find that butterfly in that particular area so typically if you look at uh, urban spaces where you have uh, uh, either uh, you know ornamental flowering plants uh, especially gardens in big cities those are almost useless for butterflies and moths because exotic plant species and ornamental plants have no value as host plants so i keep telling paper i keep telling people that rewild your gardens rewild your green spaces these nice green lawns that we have are not of any value to anybody other than making us feel nice but it's not good for wildlife so take your lawns rewild them take your ornamental plants and put flowering species that are native rather than uh, you know ornamental and if you do that, you will get a host of butterflies and moths in your own home garden. So this is the life cycle of the tawny coster. These are some common uh, butterflies that you could see and their host plants. This is uh, uh, the, the, the red pioro. Uh, its host plant is uh, calancho. Uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, the the red puro uh, is seen in my garden throughout the year, including the winter months. But uh, this butterfly never had its traditional range in Western Himalayas. It was known from Peninsular India, and it was known from the Eastern Himalayas. And in Western Himalayas, which includes Uttarakhand, Himachal, and Jammu and Kashmir, it's it has actually spread its range with this with the spread of Kalancho in people's gardens over the last probably the last two decades so this is one of the butterflies whose range has, has a, expanded with uh, with its host plant range being expanded the second butterfly is uh, is uh, uh, the common puro which lays eggs on bear again uh, again a, a common uh, plant in uh, in many in many places including peninsular india then there's the pea blue very obviously lays eggs on uh, on uh, peas uh, the plain tiger which is on uh, the milkweed plant or what's called the ark and so on and so forth i don't need to walk through all of these basically this covers a whole bunch of uh, common butterflies and common host plants and uh, so this is uh, you know the uh, the common leopard which lays uh, eggs on the on the willow the palm fly which lays eggs on palm plants another very common butterfly the common castor which lays eggs on the castor plant and so on and so forth so this covers uh, at least and all the butterflies i'm showing now are actually found throughout india and uh, are probably amongst the most common species and if you have uh, a spattering of these plants in your garden there's a very high chance that you will actually see these species in your home gardens itself uh, what's the the best way to rear butterflies and uh, moths? Uh, well, the very first step is to find uh, butterfly caterpillars. And uh, the best way to find butterfly caterpillars is uh, to know their larval host plants. But even if you don't know their larval host plants, uh, the easiest way to actually is to look for uh, droppings of the caterpillar. So you will actually see, uh, you know, caterpillar shit on the ground. And uh, that's one way. And the other way is you'll see leaves that are eaten. And if you spot eaten leaves, there's a good chance that it's a caterpillar. It may also be beetles or maybe some other insects as well. But that's the easiest way to look for butterfly caterpillars. You won't believe this, 
uh, over the past six months or so, whenever I've gone and conducted activities in schools with uh, school children on finding butterfly or moth caterpillars in the home garden, you cannot imagine the excitement the kids have shown. And more often than not, they are finding caterpillars much quicker and much easier than I was, I was spotting them. So, uh, you know, the, if you're doing activities and you're doing this with children, it's a great idea to first tell them, go out onto your school campus and go and look for butterflies. And you cannot imagine the excitement. In fact, in many of the schools that I did this, I got calls from the school saying, please come back. The kids want, want you to help them find more caterpillars and they want to rear them. And uh, it's great fun. I mean, you know, the kids appearing under leaves, they're looking at, they're asking me, what is this plant? Is it a common host plant? And uh, they're looking for caterpillars, they're looking for eaten leaves, they're looking for fallen poop. And it's good fun. After, after you have uh, found the caterpillar, you need like a plastic jar of this kind. And in the plastic jar, you need, uh, you need to put the caterpillars and uh, uh, ensure that you're feeding the caterpillars uh leaves of the same host plant on which you found it so it's it's really really important that you know what you cannot just take any plant leaves it won't eat it will only eat the plants uh, that uh, its host leaves of its host plant so uh, you put it in a jar you feed it uh, uh, you put in a few leaves of the host plant you cover the jar with a with a cloth like this with uh, a cloth or a handkerchief or whatever, but tie it, tie it tight so that the caterpillar can't get out. And then uh, you take care of the caterpillar. Uh, I normally say that you should uh, feed it uh, fresh leaves almost daily. Uh, and at least every day or every other day, clean the jar for of caterpillar droppings. Uh, if you don't, there's a chance that, uh, you know, there may be fungal infection on the caterpillars and so on and so forth. And... Uh, Typically, it will take 10 to 14 days for the caterpillar. It will go through four stages like this. And uh, it will uh, then eventually pupate. Ideally speaking, you should be taking photographs at every stage. You know, take photographs of uh, the caterpillar as it, as, it, uh, as it goes through its four instars. And then eventually, it will pupate like this. Uh, for butterfly caterpillars, it's a very nice idea to put a stick inside the jar so that the butterfly can pupate on this. And this is the way a pupa gets formed. And then uh, at this point in time, once the pupa is formed, you need to do nothing. Uh, you just leave it alone and just watch it. And maybe after another 7 to 10 days, the adult butterfly will emerge. You can photograph it and then release it. It's very important that you release the butterfly in an area where you found the caterpillar. So if you found it in your home garden, you release it in your home garden. If you found it in a forest, go and release it in the forest. Don't, re don't release it in your home because there's, you, you cannot be sure that the host plant will be found readily near your home. It's very important to release it where you found it. For... Moths, the cycle is very, very similar. This is like uh, uh, a moth which is called the small Indian tussor silk moth. Uh, and this uh, is the, the life cycle of the moth is very similar to butterflies. Eggs followed by caterpillars, followed by pupa, followed by the adult moth. The one difference between butterfly life cycles and moth life cycles is that uh, moth caterpillars spin a cocoon Whereas butterfly caterpillars actually make uh, their uh, pupa, or which is called a chrysalis, out of protein. Not it's not it's not spun out of silk. And the kind of uh, if you look at the pupa of a butterfly and a moth, you can easily make out that okay, this is a butterfly and this is a moth. Uh, the psych again a whole bunch of uh, common host plants of uh, common moth species. I'm not going to go through each of these in detail, uh, but I've tried to cover moths that are found throughout the country. I've also covered plant species that are found uh, throughout the country. Obviously, very many more moths than uh, uh, there are butterflies because the number of families are, are many, many more. Uh, very interestingly, 
uh, the the kind of uh, caterpillars you have and the kind of uh, uh, pupae you have for moths are very varied. So in many cases, you have uh, uh, caterpillars of moths that are what are called leaf folders. So they will actually fold the uh, leaf in this manner and uh, stay there. Many other caterpillars actually feed a pod and food borer. So they, you will find them inside either peas or fruit or whatever. Uh, many other moths such as this one, which is a lichen moth, actually builds a cocoon inside an igloo-like structure consisting of hair. So many, many different kinds of caterpillars and pupa exist. Uh, and uh, you can make out whether it's a butterfly or moth by just looking at the pupa. The rest of the process is very similar. Uh, you look for caterpillars in your home. Uh, for moth caterpillars, a nice idea is to actually go searching for caterpillars at night as well. Many moth caterpillars are active at night. And it's actually easier to spot them at night. And, uh, you know, you can look under leaves. You can shine the torchlight. You can look for spotting the same process that you use for butterfly caterpillars. An interesting thing, uh, many people ask me that what, what kind of success do you have? And, uh, you know, interesting inputs for people is that if typically a butterfly lays between 100 to 200 eggs, in the wild, it's been estimated and these are only estimates that only 2 to 3% of eggs actually result in an adult emerging. And why is that so? That is so because there is there's lots of predators out there. There's birds, there's other insects, there's, you know, reptiles. So there's predators that eat them. But a bigger risk for the caterpillars or butterflies and moths is parasites. About 30% of the caterpillars that I, I have reared at home, uh, the adult butterfly or moth has not emerged, primarily because there is a parasite on it. And what kind of parasites? You can have uh, parasites that, are, uh, that can be fungal parasites, such as uh, the moth over here. Or you can have uh, uh, flies and wasps laying eggs on the caterpillar. And uh, the, the larva of the fly or the larva of the wasp basically parasitize the entire caterpillar or the pupa and the adult never emerges. So almost 70% of caterpillar of butterflies and moths are lost, I won't say lost, are impacted by parasitism, pa parasites. And actually parasites are a bigger threat to uh, the early stages of butterflies and moths compared to predation. But uh, it's what, but that is part of the life. That is part of uh, life as it exists. And uh, being a parasite for a, you know, for a but for a fly or a wasp is part of its life cycle. So that's the way it is. But it's very cool. On many occasions, I've got a pupa and I suddenly find that there's no moth coming out of the pupa, but there are flies coming out of the pupa. And, uh, well, I photograph that as well because that's an interesting thing to document as well. Rearing moths and rearing butterflies is very much the same cycle. Take care of the caterpillar the way you would uh, for, uh, for a butterfly. The only difference between rearing butterflies and rearing moths is that uh, you, you would do well to put a, a layer of soil uh, at the bottom of uh, the jar. If you're not sure whether it's a butterfly or a moth, then you should just anyway put a layer of soil, maybe half an inch or an inch of soil. Primarily because uh, moth caterpillars uh, actually often bury themselves in the soil and pupate there. So that's that's the way they do it. So it's probably a, it's a, it's a good thing to have a layer of soil and uh, uh, so that if it needs to pupate in the soil, it can do that. It's also very nice to uh, record the life cycle. You know, we, I've put a simple chart over here, which shows that, uh, you know, date of collection, place of collection, habitat, simple stuff that you can use to just document uh, uh, 
you know, the, either the butterfly or the or the moth life cycle. An equally nice idea that uh, you once you have documented these uh, the life cycle of butterflies and moths, you upload it to either the butterfly or the moths of India websites, because your uh, life cycle document documentation will help increase our knowledge of these dainty creatures. Many of the life cycles that I recorded in my garden documented uh, host plants that had not been recorded before. So even in my home garden, I've actually been getting new information, information that is new to science. And even the parasites that have emerged from uh, some of the butterflies and moths I've reared is absolutely new information. We did not know that those flies or those wasps uh, are parasites for some such moth or butterfly creature. So that's again new information for uh, for butterflies and moths. Uh, I've also listed some do's and don'ts and maybe I should walk through these because these are important when you're actually rearing. Uh, I've already mentioned this, feed the right host plant leaves, uh, feed the leaves daily, clean the jar periodically, uh, ensure that the jar is well ventilated, don't cover the jar with a plastic, cover it with a cloth. And uh, also ensure that uh, you have soil if you don't know whether it's a butterfly or a moth caterpillar. But don't put so much water that uh, the caterpillar drowns. So you need to ensure that you have soil that is moist, but there's not there's no water. And also ensure the jar is large enough such that the, the moth or the butterfly can emerge. And ensure you release it in an area where the various host plant exists. Uh, what is it that you should not do? Obviously, what leaves you feed it, uh, ensuring there's not too much water. Don't keep the jar out in bright sunlight. If you do, it's more than likely that both the caterpillar or the pupa uh, may die if it is if it is too hot. And uh, so you need to keep it in a place where at least there's not bright sunlight. What can you do to help save butterflies? I mean, I think this is really important for all us urban dwellers. Uh, I think the first and foremost thing is make your home garden more butterfly and moth family. I have friends who live in Gurgaon, who live in Noida in apartment buildings and they have host plants in their balconies and they have been watching and rearing butterflies and moths in 5th, 6th, 8th, 10th floors of apartment buildings. So you can actually do this anywhere. I mean, even if you don't have a home garden and you're living in an apartment, I think you can make your home garden more butterfly and moth farm, uh, moth friendly. Plant common larval host species. If you do have uh, a home garden, uh, you're not living in a flat, uh, then for God's sake, rewild your garden. Get rid of all those pretty looking flowers that are not native species. Most of the plants that you will get from uh, common nurseries, they will give you exotic uh, flowering plants that don't have much value for uh, biodiversity. I mean, at best, some of those, uh, some butterflies and some moths may feed on the nectar of these flowers, but otherwise they don't serve any purpose. And the host plants are more important than the larval host, than the flowering plants. Because once a butterfly or a moth has laid eggs, its useful purpose in nature is almost finished. After that, it's only food for some other creature. So, you know, the host plant is far more important. And uh, spread the message about rewilding, uh, you know, your gardens. I think it's really, really important that, uh, uh, you know, we all create as much uh, space as we can for these wild creatures. And uh, I always ask people that if you're a true nature lover, you should be asking yourself that should you be doing, should you be taking actions that make you happy? Or should you be, so, so if you have a nice lawn, nice and green, or if you have a, you know, a, a garden with lots of ornamental plants, which look very nice, makes you feel good, but it's not good for nature. So if you're a if you're a nature lover, and you're saying that uh, uh, you know you, you do really care for nature, then uh, 
the things that you should be doing are not things that make you feel happy, but that's good for nature. So I think uh, that's key. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other things about frequently asked questions. You know, is it difficult to rear butterflies and moths at home? Uh, it's not difficult. I think the experience that I've had with, uh, you know, at least going to schools and stuff like that, what I have been doing is that whenever I go to a school to conduct an activity around this book, uh, what I've done is I've, I've actually carried a jar of uh, an empty jar or two with me. And uh, when, once the kids have found the caterpillars, I've, I've said, okay, here's the jar, put the caterpillar in it now, and now rear it and, and do the entire documentation. So actually giving them a few plastic jars and on the spot kicking off uh, the rearing exercise, a really nice way to get the kids excited. So it's very easy to do. It's not much effort. Uh, it probably means spending just a few minutes every day, but it also means being patient. I mean, you, you it will take anything between four to six weeks for the entire cycle to happen. Uh, another important thing to remember is that uh, if you are doing this documentation, then make, uh, you know, ensure that you are contributing to citizen science platforms like Butterflies and Moths of India so that your documentation actually serves some purpose. What's the best time to look for caterpillars? Uh, butterflies and moths are cold-blooded, so they're not active in the winters. So the best time to look for caterpillars is basically, uh, you know, summer and monsoon months. Uh, it's the best season. Time of the day, they could be active during the day, they could be active at night, so it, it, you can look for it at both times. And uh, another interesting thing is that uh, in many cases, this four to six weeks that I've mentioned doesn't hold true. If the weather changes, if it becomes too cold, then the caterpillar or the pupa may overwinter for the whole winter. So there are times that I have had a pupa which has has taken it has taken six months for the adult to emerge. So sometimes it does happen. But uh, it's good. I mean, these these are all learning, uh, you know, th things for us to learn that which species overwinters and which doesn't. And as for kids, I mean, just watching the entire metamorphosis of, you know, a caterpillar to a pupa to a butterfly or a adult butterfly or a moth is incredible. And it's something that they will never, ever, ever forget. Right. So I think this is a great way to get uh, kids and youth involved in in nature and getting them interested in nature and uh, and of course it doesn't prevent people from using this uh, book even if, if you're not a kid <laughs> that's fine and uh, this uh, so this book basically uh, is uh, meant for free distribution so we have already distributed about I don't know how many copies uh, so if anybody wants a free copy of this book, you need to be part of an institute. Uh, we, are, we are giving free copies to institutes. You only need to pay for shipping. And for those of you who want uh, uh, free copies, you can just download either a PDF or an ebook. I've just sent the link uh, to download the PDF of this uh, in the chat box. You can just download it for free. There's no problem at all. Uh, our whole idea was that we didn't want to sell this. We didn't want to commercialize it. We just want to, you know, uh, give people as many copies as they want. So these are, this is also available in ebook form. It's available for MacBooks, Windows, Android phones. Uh, you can, uh, you can download those as well, or you can just use the PDF link that I've given up there. And uh, I think uh, that more or less covers uh, uh, my part of the, talk many times i've been asked by people as to uh, you know are we hurting the butterflies and moths when we are doing this and uh, uh, i mean is it is aren't we interfering with nature so i think doing an activity of this kind is actually always a, a mix between uh, the search for knowledge uh, creating interest amongst people and uh, and uh, 
typically a butterfly or a moth lays 200 eggs uh, of which 200 caterpillars emerge and we are normally rearing one or two so typically i tell people that you should actually have maybe one two three caterpillars of the same species in a jar don't have more than that uh, that's uh, probably the maximum you should have and uh, i don't know whether there are any questions that people have raised that i need to answer but we have about 20 minutes left and uh, i'll be happy to take questions and answer them yes yeah, so so there are many questions sanjay i'll read them out to you okay and you could answer them <clears throat> let me stop your slide show right yeah. and um so so let me start with the first one vinay singhal is asking how can the factor just taking the plants how can factor just taking the plants to other geography that can bring in specific butterfly also to the region what he's probably trying to say is that uh, by planting host plants in another uh, geographical region how will they attract butterflies uh, you know there which probably don't belong to that area no i i i actually frankly i would not encourage that we do that i would encourage that you plant native species native plant species i mean this spread of for example the red puro uh, because of the spread of its host plant is primarily because kalancho is a garden plant garden plant and people have moved that garden plant from one place to another and the butterfly has spread uh, organically it's not it was not something done de deliberately by humans uh, but typically i would say that you should be i mean ideally speaking we should not have been planting kalancho and bryophyllum and all of that in dehradun and in the western himalayas because they are they are not native plants so we should not be planting non native and alien species we should only be planting native species correct so uh, abhishek is asking there were four four caterpillars of common momon on my curry patta plant yeah. an expert said two of them were going to pupate within 2 to 3 days but right. suddenly they all disappeared i can't understand what happened the plant is on the balcony of third floor and there's no other plant where they could move so i'm assuming that they were eaten by a <laughs> predator no <laughs> correct more than likely they were eaten by a predator that's what has happened okay. i'm guessing uh, venus singers is saying to what heights the butterflies uh, can go i mean butterflies i've been seeing I mean, I have seen butterflies at six thousand meters, yeah, so six and a half thousand meters in altitude. So, apartment building and all, no problem. See, the thing is, the butterflies typically will go to places where they can either find their host plant or they can find nectaring plants to feed on. More than likely, the butterflies that have gone up, you know, to a five floor, six floor apartment building, they have been blown up by the breeze, and then they have found. Uh, a host plant or a, a nectaring plant on which they've gone and fed naturally speaking they would not you know say in, in a place like delhi or in a place like bombay they would not go up to the fifth or the sixth floor uh, those are exceptional cases yeah so in 2006 i came across this party from japan at rotang pass yeah and they were collecting butterflies yeah so there was a there was a tourism outfit not just one but many that were bringing people to india to collect butterflies yeah you know so i hope all that is stopped now it's uh, i hope that stopped i hope that stopped and i hope that if you ever see that again call one of us or call the for local forest department yeah. all of this is illegal yeah. it's not allowed they are not allowed to collect without permits yeah. they are not allowed to take out of the country without uh, i mean there's so many national and international right. laws that they are breaking that you i mean Uh, it, yeah, there was this. Uh, yeah, one of our tourism ministers in one of the speeches said that we should encourage butterfly collection tourism. So you know, it, it was it was way back three two decades ago. So bad idea. <laughs> you know, yeah, bad idea. Okay, so um, uh, Mohit is asking, can you tell us about some host plants we could plant in our gardens in urban Delhi? so in urban delhi the things that you can plant uh, uh, is that you can have say curry leaf that's curry patta you can have uh, bear you can have uh, these the the lily uh, uh, you know any species of lily that is native uh, 
you can have uh, arc or uh, you know calotropus gigantea uh, you can have uh, you know these are all common you can have a castor plant uh, you can have the bear plant uh, even fruiting trees like i mean if it's a garden uh, and not an apartment then all your fru- all your fruiting trees mango lychee guava uh, all of these are good for both butterflies and moths bamboo is good uh palm is good uh i hope all and even even vegetables cabbage pea uh, all brassica cauliflower all of this veg if you have a vegetable garden it's great it's great for butterflies and moths only if it gets infested with caterpillars then don't 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 get hassled i mean this is part of the cycle that you know they need they need those plants to be able to survive so it's it's okay and mohit if you ever want some of these plants you could either contact me or go to neha saibi parul has been planting a whole lot of host plants there and uh, sohil madan is here so there are plenty of people who are interested in this sort of work so so contact us and then we'll we'll help you uh, you know acquire some of these plants for your garden uh emmy parker is asking i'm the student of zoology and i do rear butterflies commonly what are the unique behaviors seen in the butterfly's life cycle what are the unique behaviors so I, there's a whole bunch of stuff we can talk about you know in terms of how the caterpillars uh, pupate how the caterpillars camouflage themselves to prevent themselves from e- being eaten uh, how the adult butterflies lay their eggs you know there are many butterfly species that adopt a sp- strategy of laying single eggs at a time uh there are many butterflies that lay a cluster of eggs in one place uh and all of these have different strategies you know in terms of what they are doing to basically ensure survival of the species uh, there are so many uh, uh you know uh, i would say uh, uh protective strategies that caterpillars have i mean there are so many caterpillars that are well camouflaged there are so many caterpillars that are bitter tasting there are some that are bitter tasting and foul smelling Uh, there are some adult moths that mimic uh, butterflies uh, there are some butterflies that mimic moths i mean like bitacean mimicry milurian mimicry there's so much that's happening in the natural world uh, lots and lots of different stuff happening and at every stage at, at the egg at the caterpillar at the pupal and at the adult stage yeah. <coughs> wonderful karma wants to know what is the easy way to identify moths So what's the a... what's the easy way <laughs> i i would say that the the single biggest resource for uh, uh, moths in india is the moths of india website uh, i've sent put the link up there uh, you know this has a uh, 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 2800 moth species uh, it's the biggest resource for moths in india and for people who uh, you know haven't ever done Uh, any uh, any uh, any mocking at all uh, i think that's probably the best place to begin uh, i mean i don't know what else to say because it's it's never easy doing moths but uh, that's probably the best place to begin i mean it's the most comprehensive uh, single location uh, this thing we are also in the process of coming out with a moth mobile app which will have uh, the 250 common moth species it's a process of being uh, developed and that will be another resource and we'll again it will be av- it will be freely available to people you can download it uh, and then there are there are lots of there are a few books out there that you can use uh, uh, for uh, for moths i mean the only big hurdle for moths is that uh, common names don't exist for most species and, uh, you have to live with the fact that there are uh, mostly only scientific names uh, correct yeah this time this time we were conducting a few uh, sessions of uh, you know moth watch in pangot and delhi and uh, and they were just jaw dropping experiences yeah. they were absolutely phenomenal you know and there were these patterns where the moths will certain kind of moths would appear at certain times of the night you know and yeah. then disappear and the other ones would come so it was so interesting to see how um, so this year we we're going to do a lot more and from more from educational and um, understanding purpose you know 
get uh, experts like you to to guide us as we go along so yeah. that'd be fantastic okay adyan um, uh, adityan is asking hi sir should we change the host leaves daily while rearing in a jar or does the cat cats the caterpillar is able to eat the leaves and that have been dried out as well well uh, typically uh, if they've dried out then it will find it difficult to eat so i normally suggest that every day or every other day you should put in at least a couple of fresh leaves uh if if it, especially if the caterpillar is small then it will not be able to eat dried leaves uh, and it okay will... right abhishek is saying that uh, permission do we require permission under biological diversity act 2002 uh to collect specimens or samples yes i mean for collecting uh, for for rearing butterflies and moths that are for rearing caterpillars that are in your home garden you don't need any permission because you're not really collecting you're releasing it back into the wild but if you're collecting specimens if it's in a protected area you need permission from uh, the state forest department uh you you may also need uh, permission to collect from the the state biodiversity authority and if you're sending uh, uh, specimens outside the country uh, which is what a lot of the japanese and the europeans have been doing then you need permission from the central government from the national biodiversity authority you cannot even take state department of state wait um rupa manjuri biswas is asking up to what temperature can butterflies and moths endure what is their bandwidth Yeah, I mean, you know, so I, I, mean, I, I can share one of my experiences. 2016, uh, I, w- I went to Ladakh, and uh, my primary purpose was going to watch butterflies. So before going for the visit in 2016, I asked any, you know, I must have spoken to at least 20 people saying, "I want to go and watch butterflies in Ladakh. Uh, where should I go?" Everyone told me, "You're crazy. There are no butterflies in Ladakh." And I said, "Listen, man, I mean, you've got to. There are butterflies. We just need to find them." And effectively there was no one who was able to give me any help so then i just drew up my own schedule itinerary i said okay this is what i'm going to do we went all the way from le which is like you know 20 25 26 100 meters all the way up to uh, 5000 meters we found butterflies at 5000 meters as well and uh, so in terms of altitude you know you can get them all the way up to 6000 in terms of temperature obviously they need sunshine they are cold blooded creatures uh, they need sunshine to be active and in ladakh it's sunny so uh, you know you they have very short life cycles in places like uh, ladakh so during my 10 day visit i saw 41 species out of which 25 were new for me i went back in 2018 and again in a 10 12 day visit i saw another 41 42 species uh, there are more than 100 uh, species of butterflies in uh, ladakh and about half of them are what is called paleartic species so they're not found anywhere else and about 50% are oriental so they are found both in higher altitude as well as the rest of india but at least 50% are paleartic species that you not find anywhere else but uh, in that uh, terrain fantastic so uh, rashmi is asking there are hundreds on rain lilies plant so what happens to them as i don't see many emerge as adults yeah that is very typical you know and uh, this is what i mentioned right in the beginning that uh, there are this happens repeatedly okay uh, in in my home garden i have uh, my anchal my wife grows grapes so every year in the month of august the grape vine gets defoliated by a, a burn a moth that is called a burnet moth and uh, it's a very pretty bluish black moth that flies during the day so it's day flying okay i have never ever seen that moth in the wild the only time i have seen it is when i have reared it or it has just emerged from its pupa and it's sitting on the wall of the house otherwise i've never seen it the the lily thing that you're talking about the moth is basically called the lily moth it's a very pretty black uh, moth with yellow and pink and red spots you will not see it until you rear it 
and this story repeats itself i mean in in my uh, in my uh, society uh, we have uh, uh, ficus trees fig trees and there's a burnet moth which is crimson red in color bright red it's the one of the prettiest moths i've seen and there are hundreds of caterpillars of that moth every year in the last decade i have seen that moth a live moth once so this remains a mystery i mean you know and this happens actually with many many moths it happens with many butterflies that you don't really see them i mean even if they are day flying you don't see them and only the only way you can figure out that they exist around you is to rear them this is this is a common common thread between both butterflies and moths and it happens all the time wonderful so gopal is asking so what do you think about migration um of butterflies well migration happens i mean the most well known migration is uh, the migration of uh, you know the what's called the milkweed butterfly or the the the, the, the dinades or the monarchs as we call them that happens in south india where uh, they migrate from the western ghats to the eastern ghats uh, just ahead of the monsoon season and i mean if you ever been in the western ghats in the right season you will see hundreds and hundreds of uh, you know tigers and crows and stuff like that there are other butterflies and moths that do migrate but they not well studied i know that hawk moths there are a few species of hawk moths that have been uh, known to do altitudinal migration Uh, but there hasn't been much study on migration in in india for both butterflies and moths i mean i think it's it's an un- unexplored field wonderful uh, gitanjali is asking why don't we think of creating butterfly farms rather than having badly maintained butterfly parks around our zoos well i don't know what you mean by butterfly farm i would just say that you have just rewild your own garden yeah <coughs> i mean that's it mm-hmm. and uh, i i see a question somewhere here that uh, you know i have 2 hectares of land and stuff like that so i if anybody if anybody i will put in my email over here i have readily depending on where you are based and i definitely have it for delhi i have a list of larval host plants that are native to delhi list of host plants that are native to dehradun and a few other areas in the country and uh, you send me an email i will just send you the pdf which gives both nectaring plants as well as host plants that you can plant locally just plant them and i think if you are in in ncr i think the best place to get information about rearing is go to bnhs at asola batti uh, yeah and they have been uh, doing creating butterfly gardens across uh, ncr i think for the last i don't know how many years yeah so soil and yeah. is still just help you i mean they will help you get the plants they will tell you what to plant and every all of that help i think it will be available here i think soil is not on this call but no he was supposed to be uh, yeah, and but, uh, he had to go to his dentist yeah uska daan kharab ho gaya ha but uh, yeah, so but i think that's 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 the best uh, you know uh, the bnhs team at asola batti are the best people to contact if you are in the ncr area and uh, parul has also written down a few species you know vajradanti yeah ark calotropus gigantea caparis is good for a lot of pierids yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah so all of that and you can come to neher saibi also to pick up a few plants if you like or you can go to sola batti you know so we'll help you with that okay great so friends if you've got more questions we we running out of time now and um, i'd like to conclude the session here and uh, if you you know this was absolutely a wonderful very very interesting webinar one of the best so far and i'm glad this finally happened it's been due for a long time very difficult to catch this very busy man uh, who will be chasing butterflies and moths but finally we did and i'll tell you this webinar will be replayed you'll get a link and those who missed this will get the replay link anyways and later we will host this on host this on youtube so you don't have to miss it you know you you can share it you can uh, use it again for information you can reach out to sanjay uh, sanjay just say your um, uh, say your email id verbally so that it sanjay, sanjay dot sondi1 at the rate gmail dot com uh, feel free to you know send me an email that's the best way i'll repeat it okay, sanjay and- dot sondi1 at the rate gmail dot com one as in the number okay. one 
Wonderful. And uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll send everybody an email with your coordinates so that, you know, people can get in touch with you Not as we go along. And yeah? if anyone wants uh, copies of the, we have hard copies of the uh, rearing butterflies and this thing, but we are, we are giving it free to institutions. Uh, so if you are in, associated with an institution, school or otherwise, then one free copy we are. Uh, you know, we'll we'll ship it to you. There's no problem. You can write into us. This, uh, yeah. That's fantastic. So, thank you, Sanjay. Thank you, friends, for being here. Thank you, uh, Gaurav, and thank you, team, for putting this together. Thank you. Uh, my team works uh, pretty hard behind the scenes. So, uh, so thank you, uh, everyone, for making this happen. This was very good. I hope we 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 are able to work more towards. Um, butterflies and moths and save the world, um, you know, save their world and then, you know, protect them from various other threats of habitat depletion and uh, bring more opportunities to a new generation to appreciate them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.